Raise your hand if you went to a Christian college. Excellent. Look around. These are people that you like. Just kidding, guys. Um, out of, I'm just joking. Out of everyone here that went to a Christian college, raise your hand if they required chapel attendance, chapel service. And uh, raise your hand if sometimes, like, they would do a talk on, on, like, the homecoming court or announcements or talk on STDs, and that would be kind of a frustrating experience for you, <laughs> right? Because you are expecting, like, hey, let's worship, let's hear, it. let's hear a message, tell me something about Jesus, and all of a sudden they're, like, talking about the importance of birth control. It can be frustrating. All right. Some of you understand. That's fine if, if you haven't been there before. Um, today's message, I hope, isn't that kind of an experience for you. Um, there's two main reasons for us as a church to use Sunday morning to focus on kind of our small group ministry. And um, the first is just to give glory to God for what he has done and what he is doing. And the second is that we would be even more so a like-minded community to understand what's going on in and around our church um, and, and just to sort of experience that genuine like-mindedness together. So without further ado, um, I was talking to the assistant pastor at Cross Culture Community Church. They meet in our building and uh, we do joint services with them sometimes. But anyways, I happened to run into her and she said, you guys have a pretty good small group ministry, don't you? And, uh, and we talked about that a little bit. And my response to her was yes and no. Um, yes, because we've done a lot. Yes, because we've got a lot going for us. Um, and as a matter of fact, in many ways, you could say that we are defying expectations. But also no, because we're unsustainable. So that's kind of, we're going to flesh all of that out today. Um, we've defied expectations. So small group experts say that it takes about four years for a church to fully adopt a culture of small group ministry, a small group ministry mentality. We accomplished this in our first year. Um, and I say we accomplished this in our first year. I mean that we as a church, I also mean that with God's blessing and God's grace, um, and, and so I'm just so thankful to God for, uh, for all that he's done for us. Our first year, we had seven small groups and about 100 participants in those small groups. This year, we've had seven small groups, and we will finish out the year with 97 participants. In a, in a Christianity Today article, there's a Pastor Ed Stetzer. He is an author who specializes in church research and revitalization. And he said that some would say that, not, that 50% of your Sunday morning attendance should be in small groups. Realistically, though, I don't think that 70% is an unreachable goal for, for churches that rightly emphasize small groups. And so, to, man, to put that into some perspective for you, as you guys might have already caught a glimpse of, we have almost 80% of our average Sunday morning attendance involved in small group ministry. Um, and so there are, there are pastors and churches and researchers that say, man, it's not unrealistic to think that you could have 70% of your Sunday morning attendance in small groups. And we've got 80%. Amazing stuff. Thank you guys for that. I want to point out something else that's significant. Saddleback. Saddleback Church is a North American church that's kind of a leader in small group ministry. They expect about 80% of their small groups to make it throughout the year, um, from beginning of the year to the end of the year of their small group ministry. They actually said that one year they had about 67% of their small groups make it through the year, and they realized that they needed to fix that. So they put a lot of structure in place, hired people, um, and really went to work on it, and they got that number down to 80% of their small group stayed from beginning to end of the year. For the past two years, all of our small groups and their leaders have finished out the year. We've had a 100% of our small groups remain for the entire year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of this stuff, incredible. God is good is definitely the right response. 
God is good, and, and we have an obedient group of Christians who desire fellowship, who know the importance of meeting together, who are willing to make time in their schedules for it. All of America is busy. You guys are busy. I'm busy. And yet, here you are doing it, embracing the grind week in and week out, pursuing each other, pursuing God, growing together, acting We'll get there, acting more and more like a New Testament church. So to summarize, here's what we've done. We've built a clear structure with crucial values. We built a small group culture in a quarter of the time that it was supposed to take us. We surpassed participation goals of most pastors, churches, researchers. Our retention rate for small groups during the small year, group year is perfect. And because of this, our church has been able to minister to one another in a way that's more reflective of New Testament expectations than we've been able to do in the last eight years, at least. So, you know, how is all of this possible? I think think we have a lot going for us. No doubt we need to give God a, a lot of glory, a lot of thanks, a lot of gratitude for what he's doing in Wake Park Church. Man, this is the healthiest church that I've been a part of, and it's just been amazing to be a part of it. But there are a lot of factors at play for why we've been able to do what we've been able to do. The senior members of our church set the example for us by giving up their resources and giving up their power and giving up their preferences in order to see our church grow. And I think that's important for us to keep talking about. Senior members of our church invested their money into a building project and a capital campaign. Not just our senior members, all of our members have done that and are doing that. They voted in young leadership. They hired kind of a younger pastor. I don't know if we can call you that anymore. Starting to get a little gray. Just kidding, guys. They embraced change, even when it meant that they would lose things that they enjoyed. Their space looks different, their worship looks different, and their preaching looks different. Can we just hear it for our senior members who have paved the way? I mean, talk about just really raising the bar high for all of us. And such an important message for us to remember when we become senior members of a church And we have all of the power and all of the preference and all of the money. And we have to go, God, it's all yours. God, we want to see your kingdom grow. Even if it means that we're not comfortable. Even if it means that things aren't familiar to us anymore. Pastor Corey and the board were sensitive to God's spirit, to the needs of the congregation. You know, they correctly diagnosed the needs of the church. They took risks. They invested in a full-time small group pastor before having a full-time youth pastor, before having a full-time children's ministry pastor. They did it because they knew that that's what our church needed at this time, instead of just doing what churches normally do. Investing in a full-time small group pastor before children's ministry and before full-time youth ministry pastor is almost completely unheard of in the church world. And lastly, our church stepped up. Some of you were asked to be leaders. Some who were asked to be leaders didn't necessarily think it was right for them. Others wanted to lead but might be felt unqualified for the job. Some wanted to be leaders but knew that it would require giving up a part of their life to find the time for it. And each one of you that participates in a small group ministry has made your small group community what it is. Um, And it just wouldn't be possible without each and every person in our church willing to do it. So thank all of you so much for um, just for being a part of the life of the church, for investing in the church, for being willing, for making it happen. So some of you know I went to Southern California this past March um, and just spent several days at Saddleback Church in a small group pastor's conference I originally went because I wanted to know what it was that I didn't know, right? <laughs> what, are the, what are my blind spots? What are the things that other people are aware of that they're doing that, that we're not doing? Um, and what it ended up being was a time of encouragement for me and also a time of 
defining, defining what it was that our small groups were meant to be. So, so let me kind of, let me, let me walk you through that a little bit. One pastor I met, his name was Ron Wilbur, and he was the pastor of small group health at Saddleback Church, former pastor of small group health at Saddleback Church. I told Ron um, about our small group ministry. I told him about the, the history of our church, and he said, you must lie awake at night with excitement about all the things that God is doing in your church. I know I would. Man, now here's a guy that's been involved in small group ministry um, for 50 plus years of his life, who's been doing it, who knows what it takes and knows what it looks like and knows how hard it can be. And he hears about our church and this is his response, that he would be lying awake at night if he was a part of a church like this. That for me was just such a resounding affirmation that we as a church were in a good position. And here's the other encouraging thing for me. When I was at this conference, there seemed to be just a a plethora of pastors that had 100 small groups, 300 small groups. I think Saddleback Church has um, around 3,000 small groups these days. When I shared with people about how much our church was involved in small groups, or when I told them that our senior pastor and our board made small groups a priority, people were envious. When I told these pastors that our people were ready for a small group ministry and that they jumped right in and that we didn't have issues with participation, there were pastors there that wished that they had what we had. When I told them that as a church we invested in a a full-time small group pastor first, they were shocked. None of what they were hearing was was typical behavior. When small group pastors there were asked to rate their church's small group culture on a scale of 1 to 10, most of those pastors rated their small group culture as a 4. And no one there said anything above a 6. And it was eye-opening for me to realize that the resources of a megachurch didn't automatically mean that they were more effective at ministry. And that was really cool for me to just, I'll just, I'll just be honest with you. It's, it's been easy for me before to look at mega churches and go, I wish I had those resources. I wish we could do things like that. And here I was surrounded by small group pastors of mega churches that wanted what we had. Um, and I thought that that was super cool. And then came some, some defining moments. I, I want to talk to you about this a little bit. Um, I I went to this small group breakout conference with these small group pastors, a breakout session during the conference, and it was called How to Make Disciples That Make Disciples. And actually what they ended up talking about was all the questions were formatted around how do we make environments that create disciples? And all of the answers were formatted around how do we make environments that make people feel comfortable? So we were... uh, really far away from our goal, how to make disciples that make disciples. And the pastors there were talking about how to make environments where people can feel comfortable. Um, And so they they began to spout off answers, you know, for for how to make these discipleship environments. And they talked about it needs to be comfortable. It needs to be a place where people won't feel judged. It, It needs to be a place where we raise the bar high, but not too high. It needs to be reachable. And if they fail then they should know that it's okay to fail. And people know, need to know that they aren't going to um, be judged. And it just kind of went on in this direction for a little bit. And then, and then one pastor spoke up, and he just said, but how do we reach millennials? And, uh, and that was more or less the breaking point for me, for whatever reason, right? And so I just kind of dramatically leaned forward in my chair And I'm like, guys, half of the members of your small groups are struggling with pornography this month, maybe even this week. How did anything that we just described, how's how's anything that we just described going to change that? The divorce rates in church are almost the same as the divorce rates outside of church. How is anything that you just described going to make a difference there? 
you know, and just frustrated. Because if we're going to make disciples that make disciples, I don't want to make disciples that are trapped in sin, that make disciples that are also trapped in sin. And we got some of that, you know, in that there, there are people around who are like, hmm, that sounds good. <laughs> you, know, you know, and then we, but then we went on. And, and the next person that spoke up was like, well, I think we should do this to attract millennials. And I was like, no, we lost it. And then we just moved on. And that was really hard for me, really frustrating, because here are small group pastors that have 300 small groups, that have 100 small groups, and they're not willing to, they weren't at that moment willing to talk about what seemed to me the most important things to talk about. The last session of that conference was led by a guy named Carl George. Carl George is a church growth consultant. He's a veteran small groups pastor, researcher, champion, and um, he's one of the reasons that many mega churches in our country exist that are built on the backbones of small group ministry. And um, I want to tell you what he said, because his information was so concise and so clear. Um, Carl asked this question. He said, what's wrong with the small group model? And then he answered it. And he said, we aren't doing the core stuff that's needed in order to change people's lives. He actually started off this session, which was really just awesome for me. He started off this session by going, half of you are addicted to pornography. He just said, I don't care that you're a room full of pastors, 50% of you are struggling with pornography, and we need to do something about it. We need to talk about it, and we need to create structures that are willing to address it. Um, and, and so I went, I just looked around at everybody, and said, this is what I'm talking about, people. But he said, there's two things that are needed. This is the core stuff that he said. He said, one people who are willing to acknowledge their brokenness. And he referenced groups like Celebrate Recovery, where people are just willing to say, man, I am an addict. I am struggling. I am broken. You know, and I even think about um, the grief group that Joan Kindy runs at, at our church, where people are willing to say, hey, I am hurting. I am broken, I am at a loss, I am mourning, I am missing something. And the second thing that he said was, people who lovingly interrogate their friends and invest in each other's lives. Yeah? Um, And he he referenced John Wesley's small groups um, about five times, actually. And so there I was sitting. So just this, this Baptist kind of conference, and, and people were, were faced with this, this strategy of people acknowledging their brokenness and lovingly interrogating their friends. And I also thought about our, our women's grief group that Joan runs, where they ask really pointed questions and ask questions that they might not even consider um, on their own time. These two things, for me, were the perfect summary of what our small group's ministry should look like. And I'll say one more. There's a, I heard recently somebody say that churches should be like hospital gowns. Um, and they just said hospital gowns were for ease of access and they were for healing, right? They're not for modesty. It's not about covering up. It's not about looking good. It's not about flattery. Churches should be like hospital gowns. They should be places where people feel okay being vulnerable um, for the sake of healing, for the sake of being worked on. Yeah, love that. So, man, not every, I want our small groups to be a place where people are fully known and fully loved. And I understand not every small group is going to get there. Not every small group will want to get there to that point of full vulnerability. And we have co-ed small groups and small groups with um, married couples in it, and so that kind of level of uh, accountability and vulnerability is hard to get. But some of our small groups will be able to get there. Some of our small groups will want to get there. And one of the things that all of our small groups can get to is this point where every small group member has one person in our church that knows them fully and loves them fully. 
every small group at our church can get to a place where each of you are fully known and fully loved. And that's my goal, (laughs) whether you like it or not, whether you're sitting there going, oh, that doesn't sound good to me in any way at all, right? I understand that. Um, But I want our small group ministry to be a vehicle for this. So I spent most of my time with a small group pastor there that oversaw a small group ministry of 300 small groups. And when I shared with him my vision and my heart for small group ministry, he didn't think it could be done. And he didn't think it could be done because he's a pastor in in, um, Minneapolis. And he didn't think it could be done because he didn't think that Minnesotans were capable of being vulnerable with each other to that level. Um, Here's the thing. I spoke with our leaders individually about my heart for our small groups, uh, about my vision, about my goal, about my desire, where we want to go. And, um, and Jean White, who, who you guys saw on stage, Jean White said, she responded to this by saying, when people ask me pointed questions, it shows me that they care. When I told it to, to Joan Kindy, she said, well, what did Jean White say? <laughs> You know, and I just said, Jean said this, said that she, she understands what it looks like and what it means to be lovingly interrogated. And our youngest leaders, um, Zach and Cameron, said, our group, in a lot of ways, is already doing that. And when I told Corey about sort of my goal and vision for our small group ministry, Um, we decided to put a focus series together. And so, man, we've got two final things going for us. We've got a vision of whole and holy communities where people acknowledge their brokenness and lovingly interrogate one another. And we've got leadership across the board from small group leaders and from um, our, our senior pastor who believes that we can get there, who has absolutely no problem saying, yeah, Even Minnesotans can get there. But we've got room for improvement, too, right? When I was asked, when I was told that we had a pretty good small group ministry, I said yes, because we've done a lot and we've got a lot going for us. But I also said no, because we're not sustainable. The truth is we've had five great small group leaders that stepped down from leadership our first year. And this year... Um, I expect that we'll have about six small group leaders step down from leadership this year. Um, That is 11 awesome people stepping down from small group ministry. Quite frankly, man, we only get so many potentially great small group leaders. It's not uh, something that everyone is gifted to do and able to do, and, um, and, and we just can't continue to lose small group leaders that way. So here's, what, here's, here's where we're going. And some of these responses are in response to our small group ministry being unsustainable, and some of it is just in response to what we feel God is challenging us with. One, we're going to pursue smaller groups. Man, our, our aim for small group ministries will be about 10 people in a small group. John Wesley preferred six to eight Some people say up to 12. Right now, I think three of our small group ministries have 16 or more small groups, 16 or more participants in them. Um, And so we just need to to decrease those sizes a little bit. I won't go into the details with that with all of you. I'm tempted to, but I understand we've got other things to do today. Um, Two, we're going to recruit more leaders. We currently have at least six more people who are thinking about starting a new small group. Some of them have um, committed to starting a new small group, and, um, and we've got several others who are still praying about it. So I just want to invite you to do the same. If, if you're in the congregation right now and you're thinking, you know, I know some people that I could start a small group ministry with, I think I'd be willing to give a year for small group ministry. Let's talk about that. Um, let's pray about that together and, uh, and flesh that out together. Number three, we're going to start beta groups. So beta groups would be groups where people can, for basically for non-Christians, for new Christians, or for nominal Christians, Christians by name only. 
And the, the beautiful thing is we want to just create environments where those people that have a lot of questions can ask those questions, where people can comfortably seek the faith, where people together can, have, can be surrounded by people that are doing the same thing. Um, and so one of the things that I love about that is like just picture like, okay, a small group discussing Ephesians. And you've got somebody in your small group that's never opened a Bible before. And they open up to the Old Testament and they're looking for Ephesians. And right, it's just kind of awkward and confusing. And when you have a small group ministry where the majority of the people are in the same place, that's being led by some mature Christians, then all of a sudden you have a place where people can say, hey, let's open up to page 100 and 1,000 and, and 100, and, uh, but maybe we'll land at Ephesians or something, um, where people can feel comfortable flipping open to the table of contents, where people can feel comfortable being the last one to get there, and where people can feel comfortable saying, I don't understand what a man dying has to do with my sins being forgiven, right, where they can ask basic foundational questions, or like, why are there dragons in the Bible? You know, that's something worth talking about at some point with some people. So, four, uh, we're going to focus on building our team rather than building our structure. I think over these last couple of years, we've done a great job building a really strong small group ministry structure. Um, but, and, and that means that now we're free to really build and invest into our leaders. We want to be more intentional about coaching and training and supporting our leaders on a more consistent basis. And number five, we're going to pray more than ever. <laughs> when I was talking to Ron Wilbur, the pastor of Small Group Health at Saddleback, he, uh, he asked to be put on a prayer team um, he, he said that it would be an honor to be updated regularly and be praying for our church. And so we're going to start a team specifically for our small group ministry to be praying for our leaders, to be praying for our small groups, to be praying for our ministry. Next year, more than ever, our small group ministry will be soaked in prayer. So here's what you can do. Number one, you can come. You can join our small group ministry next year if you're not already in it. Some of our groups will probably start meeting every other week, so if that's been an issue for you, just know that they are becoming more accessible. Number two, commit. It's easy to treat small group ministry as an extracurricular, but the truth is, man, our small groups are the cells of the body, just like the, not prisons, not prison cells. <laughs> But uh, the building blocks, right, the, the cells of life, the basic units of life, they, um, man, they compose the church body. There are some 59 one another verses in the Bible where the Holy, in the New Testament, where the Holy Spirit is saying, these are the things that are expected of a church, of New Testament Christians, and small groups are the way that we fulfill those. Consider 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Man, I love that passage because it says that God has given you grace that you are to use to serve others. You are a steward of God's grace, and your job is to serve others with it. One of the things that that means is that if you are not in a small group, or if you are not actively participating in the church body, you're withholding grace that God has given you for the express purpose of you serving others with it. I mean, the, the dignity and value that God places on each of us is enormous to the point where God will actually allow you to limit the grace that he wants to give to others. I'm going to read that verse again, just to let it sink in, because I see a lot of you staring at me. <laughs> Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. We can't do that if we don't show up. N number three, contribute. 
Don't just be a consumer of your small group. Contribute. Consider 1 Corinthians 12, 26. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation? Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Paul's expectation is that when New Testament Christians gather together, everyone brings something to the table. Harder to do in larger gatherings, Paul was writing to a church in Corinth, probably house churches, and his expectation is that everybody brings something to the table. I think that's a great idea when we come Sunday morning. What am I doing? What am I bringing to the table? Am I going to talk to somebody? Even when we pray before we get here, does, does God have a word that he wants me to share with somebody else? Is there somebody that I can encourage? Is there somebody that I can seek out? I've been reading these prayer requests from the church, and I know that some people are struggling. Who can I talk to? Am I involved in children's ministry? Am I one of the greeters or the ushers? Am I doing something today, or am I just consuming? Harder to do on Sunday morning, but still achievable. But definitely in your small groups. Are you contributing? Are you bringing something to the table? Number four, care. Care for each other. Pray for each other. Listen to one another. Love one another. Serve one another. Bear one another's burdens. Do the stuff of the New Testament church. And if that means you can't get to the curriculum that day because somebody's experiencing a crisis or a tragedy, that's okay. Care for one another. Number five, Celebrate change. There are going to be some changes that come our way. They may or may not affect your current small group. You may or may not be able to stay in your current small group. You may or may not want to stay in your current small group. But, man, sometimes when a church multiplies, when a small group multiplies, when a small group gives birth, sometimes we focus on on the things that we're losing rather than the things that we're gaining. It's, it's not awesome to have worked on a community and then to have that community be disrupted or dissolved in some sort of way. But the truth is, God uses diasporas all the time to grow his church. Um, and it's very possible that God might mess with your small group <laughs> because he wants to see that small group grow and be available to others as well. We can expect that to happen on a, a, on a smaller scale and maybe even celebrate when it does happen. Come, commit, contribute, care, celebrate change. There will be a test after service. <laughs> so you, you ended up getting a sermon after all, and you can tell because I alliterated the points <laughs> and there were some Bible verses in it. I just want, I want to take a moment to say... Man, thanks to our senior pastor for leading us and prioritizing small group ministry. I want to say thanks to our LBA for authorizing and supporting small group ministry. I want to say thanks to Don Corliss for keeping track of our budget, and uh, I also want to apologize for going overboard. Thanks to our small group leaders, again, for the time, energy, money, and passion that they've willingly given to our small group ministry. And I want to say thanks to our child care providers like Anna and Britta and Connie and Mark and Sharon and probably others that I'm failing to mention who have really made it possible for young parents to be involved in the small group ministry and experience the fullness of our church life here. Thanks to each one of you who are involved with our small group ministry. Without you, man, there is no small group ministry. Without you, there's no group. Without you, quite frankly, there's no sort of living out this New Testament church. Lastly, and most importantly, I want us to thank God. And so let's take a moment and let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, thank you for creating us. Father, thank you for creating us for relationship. Thank you that when you made Adam, you said it's not good for a man to be alone. 
and you recognized our need for community even before we did. Uh, Lord, thank you that you created us in your image, and that means that we reflect a triune God, a God who exists in community. And God, we thank you for, for Jesus, for making it possible for each one of us to be a part of the church. We thank you for Jesus, for his sacrifice on the cross, for our forgiveness of sins, for desiring a bride for your son, and for making it possible for each one of us to be a part of that bride. Lord, we pray that you would continue to use our small group ministry to help your bride look more like we should, that you would continue to sanctify us, that you would continue to make us pure and holy, that you would use community, intentional community to do that. And Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who is in each of us that confesses Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. And we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that we rely on for each of our small group communities to be effective, to be transformational, to, to have any effect at all. We know that flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. And so we confess that we need you, that we can do nothing without you. And we want you to be active and we want you to oversee, we want you to lead, we want you to guide. Lord, we want to be totally submitted and surrendered to you, and we confess our need for you in all that we do. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.